Uh, hello everyone and welcome. It's a pleasure to see you all here today for another session of our seminar series Topics in Early Modern Studies. Um, Livia and I are very thankful to everyone who has been attending lectures since the first meeting and also to those who are just arriving. Before I introduce today's speakers, I would like to give you the house rules. Please keep your microphones muted during the entire talk. After the presentation, we will have time for Q&A. Questions can be made by using the raise hand function or by typing in the chat. If you are a Portuguese, Spanish or French speaker and feel more comfortable asking your question in your own language, please feel free to do so by typing in the chat. We can translate it into English uh, for the speaker and the audience. I would also like to remind you that this session is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel later. Well, uh, having that said, today we are very honored to receive Nora Carling for her talk. Nora uh, received her BA from St. Anne's College in Oxford and was a principal lecturer at Middlesex University for several years. She continues researching 17th century British history as an independent scholar and is the author of various papers and books dedicated to the civil wars and the levelers movements. Among her works, I would like to highlight the causes of the English Civil Wars and uh, the recently published Regicide or Revolution, What Petitioners Wanted, September 1648 to February 1649. Nora was very kind to accept our invitation and give a paper entitled Regicide or Revolution, Petitioning and the Fall of King Charles I, which we are really excited to hear. Uh, thank you, Nora, once again, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for that lovely welcome and for having me here. So, do you, can I share screen now? Yes, please. Yeah. Takes a minute. Uh, it's just going to the bit. <coughs> it's just going to the slideshow now. Well, yes, we thank you very it. much for. Okay, I'm starting now. Right, thank you very much for having me and for your nice welcome. And let me also say that your poster, which is on the screen now, can you see it? Can everybody see the poster with the yes, title yes. of this yes, talk? Yes. Yeah. <coughs> the blanking it's not out. On full screen though. Sorry? It's not in full screen though, if you would like it's to. It's in full uh, screen on my computer. Yeah, here I can you Can you see just the one slide now? Uh, not yet. Not yet, but it, you will, you will. Um, well, so I'll say as introduction that the your poster with the blanking out of that memorable scene, whether intentional or not, can't remove the regicide from history, but suggests that perhaps we can forget for an hour that we know the outcome of the events of 1648 and come back to it with perhaps a different understanding. Can you see the slideshow now? Yes, yes. Okay. So, First of all, I'm going to begin by going back, not to 1649 and the execution of King Charles I, but to 1999 and a conference commemorating its 350th anniversary. I had been invited to talk at that conference about the alternative revolution, the more radical one that was considered to have failed, and I began with the large petition of the London Levellers, which was delivered to the House of Commons on the 11th of September 1648, with its list of far-reaching constitutional and legal reforms, and also some of those that followed along those lines. Here are some of the demands in the large petition of the London Levellers. Um, it had 27 clauses, including supremacy of the House of Commons, equality of all before the law, kings, lords and so on, not being treated differently, the enclosure of common lands to be laid open, the duty of the kingly office and of lords to be defined, religious toleration, not qualified in this version, but 
un undefined religious toleration with a non-compulsory public way of following Christianity. And only clauses 25 and 27 deal with bloodshed and the king. In the lead paper that day, however, it was argued that the revolution of 1649 was not motivated by political ideas, but by religious fears and superstition. <clears throat> Purging the nation from the guilt of civil war by killing the person responsible for it, Charles Stuart, the man of blood, had come to supersede all other considerations in the minds of those who carried it out, and above all, in the minds of the soldiers who were supposed to have demanded it. This interpretation, which by then was widespread, stemmed mainly from Patricia Crawford's 1977 article, which concluded that, and I quote, to many officers and soldiers, blood guilt was the decisive factor in the formation of, formation of policy, and that being convinced that Charles was a man of blood, they demanded his trial and execution. Remarkably little evidence was presented for this conclusion. Only two soldiers' petitions were cited in that article, one of which didn't deal with this aspect at all, and neither did the other exhibit any of the man of blood rhetoric. Instead, Crawford's argument was bracketed by two other sources. One, I don't know whether to call it the first or the last, um, was published in 1659, but referring to April 1648, uh, in which it was said that at a an officer's prayer meeting at Windsor in April 1648, at the beginning of the Second Civil War, it was our duty, if ever the Lord brought us back again in peace, to call Charles Stuart, that man of blood, to an account for that blood he had shed and mischief he had done. The atmosphere at that meeting was described very vividly, the bitter weeping as army leaders repented of their previous carnal conferences with the king by the soldier and agitator William Allen, who, though not an officer, had apparently been present. My main problem with this account, however, is that it was written 11 years later in a tract primarily aimed at preventing negotiations with the exile of Charles II. News reports at the time of the meeting in April 1648 say nothing to confirm that that was what was resolved or discussed at the meeting. The other source appealed to by Crawford was the August 1650 Declaration of the English Army now in Scotland. This publication's proto-fifth monarchist view of the current conflict being the battle against Antichrist for the rule of Jesus Christ on earth is totally unlike any petition or declaration that had come from the army in the period preceding the regicide. Christopher Feek, the fifth monarchist leader, was the first to say later that it seemed as if these were fifth kingdom men at the highest rate. Um, and the, I'm sorry, I need to move on now. Yeah, and although it was issued in the name of the under officers and soldiers of the English army now in Scotland. That was because it was a reply to a document addressed to the under officers and soldiers of the English army now in Scotland by the Scots. Um, so there is really no, um, no evidence as to how it came to be that way. But basically, I haven't got the time here to discuss, to mount a critique of either of those texts in detail. Um, but in, the important thing is that it was not what I had found in any of the petitions I had read so far. So I formed the ambition of finding and reading all that survived, both military and local. A contemporary news book said hundreds had been printed. That was a great exaggeration, as it turned out, and that was a relief. And so was the advent of evil, where nowadays you can find all but one of the printed texts. Though in years past, I had to trawl through many volumes of the Thomason tracts in the British Library's photocopies. In the end, I had collected 66 texts written between September 1648, when the treaty negotiations between Charles I and Parliament began on the Isle of Wight at Newport, and the execution of the King on the 30th of January 1649. In fact, a little bit beyond that, as you'll see. 20 were addressed to the House of Commons by supporters in counties, cities and garrisons, and one regiment, 
which was passed on to Parliament by the General Fairfax. All but one are noted in the Commons Journal, without the content, but often with the answers given by the House. News writers, editors and publishers were naturally keen to get copies of these petitions once they heard the news that they'd been read in the House, and all but one duly appeared in print in weekly news books or one-off pamphlets or broadsides, often including the Commons answers very accurately, which suggests they had reliable sources. And these are just examples of the type of publication. I don't expect you to read them on screen. Um, that's our uh, a single separate publication by another, a, a, a very obscure publisher. Um, the next two are weekly news books, The Moderate, which generally supported the levellers with qualifications. Um, yeah, I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but I don't think we're, you're passing or following the same slide that is displaying for us. For us, it's still the, the, I don't think you're on the same slide on your screen as the one you're detailing for us. I've got six little pamphlets on this screen. No, on our screen, at least on my screen, uh, is, is still the banner for topics in early modern studies. So I think you have to advance a little bit or click full screen. Um, is that a problem with just sorry about that. anyone? Is everyone? Yeah, if you double click there. What can you see now? Still the banner. Ah. Oh, now the six pamphlets. Perfect. Thank now you. The six pamphlets. Um, yeah. So it's not advancing when I advance. Is it okay to leave it like that? I think you have to click on each individual slide when you want to make it the main one for us. Oh. Right. Oh, no. If you if you click on uh, from current slide, right in the and, yeah. and the toolbar, I guess we're going to see the same thing uh, every time as you pass. No, is it on the whole screen? No, I guess it's not. Yeah, so maybe you have to you have to click on move. The slide. Yeah, and it's slide. I don't know what's happening. I'm sorry about it. Other people seem to have done it. Present online. Okay, if I click on the next one, can you see something different now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is it, does it begin who are brought to justice? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so go, go, back, go back to the one I had before with the six little pamphlets. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry you can't get a proper slide show, but this is okay. Um, I heard about that. Ah, yes. What I was saying was that that's a one-off separate. These two are weekly, the moderate and packets of letters. This is a broadside, rather a neat and tidy one compared with many of them. Um, this is an official army publication published by John Partridge, who was one of their regulars. And this is an unofficial publication, which has important texts and information in it. Um, but it's the best we have about the meeting at St Albans. Um, be more than twice as many petitions were addressed to Fairfax as Commander-in-Chief of all the Parliamentary Forces and from early November 1648 to him with the Council of Officers meeting regularly at St Albans and later at Windsor. Several garrisons petitions also claimed the support of sympathetic locals and in the weeks after Pride's purge, supporters in a number of groups in specific localities also addressed their concerns directly to the army. Because the military records are far less complete than Parliament's, these petitions are sometimes harder to find and authenticate. Some were published in batches by the Army's regular publishers at moments of crisis, and many were the expected responses to a letter sent out uh, from headquarters with copies of the Army's remonstrance on the 18th of November, inviting declarations of support, which they duly received. I sifted the, printing, the printed publications carefully, taking a critical approach to anonymous or pseudonymous publishers who were fond of inflating the origins of petitions 
petitions from particular regiments or garrisons becoming the demands of the army or of the Northern Brigade and so on, or of claiming without foundation from an obvious motive that their contents were ordered to be printed and published or read at the head of every regiment. As Jason Peasey and others have warned, historians from Gardner onwards have been regrettably careless about this kind of attention that has to be paid to the nature of the text. It's also the case that a number of historians have drawn supposedly typical quotations, not from the petitions themselves, but from the supporters' letters, editorial comment, or reports of parliamentary debates that accompanied the actual texts in newsbooks and pamphlets. Each petition from the soldiers is identified by their regiment or garrison, sometimes with the names of officers who, if they belong to the New Model Army, can usually be found in Malcolm Wanklin's invaluable listings in his reconstructing the New Model Army. Those in garrisons and provincial sources are Sorry, those in garrisons and provincial forces are not so well covered so far, but new research is being published all the time. Petitions from outside the army are identified by their county or city of origin, most claiming to represent not an entire community, but those well affected to Parliament's cause, the honest inhabitants or simply diverse of the inhabitants, ministers and gentry. In a small number of cases, the petition comes, it's actually four, the petition comes from the name of, comes in the name of a, the grand jury of a county or the corporation of a city, bodies that officially did represent the community, and by this time were firmly in the hands of Parliament supporters. The few surviving lists of subscribers are all copies, whether in print or in a single manuscript hand. The Nottinghamshire men who sent their petition to Colonel John Hutchinson with 309 names apologised for the number being few for lack of time. It was actually read to the Commons on the morning of the King's execution. The longest list known is found in two manuscript copies, each containing, each containing 1,135 names from one of the Kentish petitions. I haven't counted them, but thankfully Jackie Yost has. They're not identical, and one of them actually has marginal comments, noting which sections were subscribed by the party's own hands, which amount to about 47%, the rest probably being engrossed by scribes before a presentation to Parliament. While many royalists claimed that the petitions were all written by a few leaders, Cromwell's physician, Dr. George Bate, later recalled that the army leaders at this time deliberately agreed to suffer the common soldiers in their bands and regiments and officers of lesser note to have their private meetings and to frame petitions, though many people found it hard to believe their colonels were not the actual authors. The only colonel whose name actually appears on a petition was Humphrey Mackworth, Governor of Shrewsbury. It's also clear that the long political tract with classical quotations subscribed by Robert Overton's officers in the garrison of Hull was written by their commander, who at one of his Scottish prisoners described as a scholar but a little pedantic, and also the most courteous independent he had ever come across. It was, however, that is the um, Overton's tract, was published with the list of demands adopted by his officers at a general meeting, and 18 of these are named in their supporting letter. The only autograph list to survive isn't on a petition, but on a letter sent to Oliver Cromwell by 17 of his officers urging him to forward their men's petition to Fairfax. The views expressed in the soldiers' petitions don't necessarily coincide with those of their colonels, in the cases of the Dover Castle garrison commanded by Aldrin and Sydney and Thomas Harrison's regiment, they're notably different. Sydney was against the King's trial and the petition is for it. Harrison was famous for having said that the King should be prosecuted as a man of blood at Putney, um, but the, his men's petition does not include that. Some historians have suggested that cavalry troopers, who typically came from gentry or yeoman backgrounds, were more active politically than foot soldiers. But out of the regimental petitions in this collection, 10 out of 17 were from the infantry. Captains were close enough to their company or troop to know them well, and the number, 100 in a foot company at full strength, 
fewer in a cavalry troop. I think it was 60, but I found different numbers given. Could easily arrange or be called to a meeting. For Arton's regiment, as it happens, Exchequer sources confirmed that five of his cavalry troops were quartered around Farnham in Surrey at the time of their petition, as was claimed, and it's not clear whether Arton himself was actually with them. All the petitions except two are unique. They may share terms of phrase and formal demands, but only those of Harrison's and Cromwell's regiments are nearly, though not quite, identical. Cromwell's men made some amendments to the text of Harrison's, but they are very similar. Others may show individual eccentricities or unusual terms of phrase that suggest that a document was drafted by one person before being agreed, with or without amendments, by a group, then circulated for subscription. Inconsistencies and even incompatible demands in the petition, features that to this day would invite the comment composed by a committee, are more likely to reflect, reflect traces of argument and compromise than the indecision of a single author. Yes, I have some past experience of such activities, but so did 17th century guildsmen, town councillors, parish officers and grand jurymen. They were familiar with the process. So, my book is primarily a collection of texts with individual backgrounds and the context of each in the development of events. In some cases, this involves a rethinking of accepted narratives, but in it, I offer no general conclusions. So it's time to make up for that now, I think, and here are some of my thoughts so far. Have you got the next slide now? Yes. Have you got the next slide who are to be brought by brought to justice? Yes, yes. Yes, okay. The vast majority of the petitions do call for justice, and in about 25% of them, this is their only or main demand. What it means in terms of penalties is rarely made explicit. Even today, the call for war criminals to be brought to justice would be understood differently in English on different sides of the Atlantic. The phrases public justice, impartial justice, or justice without respect of persons convey explicitly or implicitly that there should be no exemption from the normal legal procedures for peers or indeed the king, even when, as in the majority of petitions, he is not named among the accused. So what do those who don't name the king explicitly or in a list say? Um, the the formulation, all incendiaries, malignants or evil instruments in the civil wars to be brought to public trial and receive condign punishment is the formulation from the Solemn League and Covenant in 1643, which is used again and again in these petitions. Um, the London levellers say the capital authors and promoters of the former or late wars in their Clause 25. Newcastle says the great incendiaries of the kingdom and the fermenters of and actors in the First and Second Wars. Um, the Common Council of London, after some debate, um, put it all the grand and capital authors, contrivers of and actors in the late wars against the Parliament and Kingdom, from the highest to the lowest. So if they don't always name him, what do the petitioners say about the king? Um, what do they say about his guilt? Um, there, uh, quite a lot is said about this, but in a minority of petitions. The London Levellers' large petition in their Clause 27, which is separate from the, the, the clause I just read, um, said the expected Parliament would have laid to heart all the abundance of innocent blood that hath been spilt, and all by commission from the King and seriously considered whether the justice of God is likely to be satisfied or yet is continuing wrath appeased by an act of oblivion. So their demand for justice is in a different clause. In this one, they're primarily opposing the act of oblivion, which promised um, uh, remission from punishment for most of the king and King's supporters, anyway, that was the issue at the time on the 11th of September when this um, when this was published, when it was presented to Parliament, um, that uh, the, the act of oblivion, uh, how many people should be exempted from it. Um, the garrisons of Newcastle, Tynemouth and other northeastern 
uh, fortresses, um, say that although evil counselors were very instrumental, yet that himself wasn't it, the principal author, contriver, a better manager of all the bloodshed, and that all endeavours for the bringing of other instruments and incendiaries to condign punishment while the grand delinquent is untouched are to little purpose as not being an acceptable sacrifice to the justice of God. And that is right at one end of the spectrum. That is, I think, the most severe thing said about the king's blood guilt in the whole collection. Um, Walton's regiment say that the common enemies of our native country are plotting to destroy the liberties and birthright of the people, purchased by the loss of their estates and blood, which cries to heaven for justice against that capital destroyer and his party, the willful shedders of the blood of some hundreds of thousands of the freeborn people of England and Ireland. Next slide. Yes, I should say that some explicitly include the king in the category of those to be brought to justice. For example, from the king to the meanest subject, a few use circumlocutions like our capital and bloody enemy, the capital offender, or him who sits on the throne, which perhaps suggests that there were other ways of desacralizing monarchy and calling him Charles Stuart, the man of blood. And I've counted all those inclusive mentions of the king among those that do mention him. What else do they say about him? There's plenty more about Charles I as an arbitrary and tyrannical ruler. We are very sensible, say the radicals of Newport Pagnell, we are very sensible by whose means and to satisfy whose prerogative fancy our lives and liberties have been ruined and almost destroyed. Lambert's brigade Recall how the Parliament acquainted with the Kingdom with the King's intentions to draw the sword of war against them for the maintaining of his own arbitrary power. And Kent calls for the punishment of the person of him who as a King ought to have defended us, but as a tyrant has actually levied arms and waged war against us. Bristol describes Parliament's negotiations with the King, treating with him as esteeming the effusion of the most excellent English blood to be but a just homage to his lusts and tyranny and all their unhappiness to be but an equitable tribute to his will and pleasure. Nevertheless, and I hope you've got this one with the title, Is the King of Guilt Certain? Have you got that on your screen now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nevertheless, there is not complete agreement among petitioners about his guilt, especially as the charges levied by Parliament against the King so far included the sensational list published by Parliamentary Authority in February 1648, which was not officially set aside until a few days before the trial eventually began. That list included accusations of his conniving at the alleged murder of his own father by the Duke of Buckingham, prompting the Irish Rebellion of 1641 and seeking foreign aid to make war on Parliament as well as a number of other equally sensational charges. So we find then that Leicestershire, which is one of the first petitions, the next one after the Leveller's petition, says, we desire that we may not be left in the dark concerning these suggestions and charges, which if true, that proceedings may be accordingly, but if otherwise, that his majesty may be cleared so fully that we may neither fear your treating with him nor trusting him in the great and weighty affairs of the three kingdoms. Ireton's regiment, and this is true of every edition of their petition and the title pages highlight this, that all such must be preceded against as traitors who act and speak in the king's behalf till he shall be acquitted of the guilt of shedding innocent blood. Some of them, most of them, may not expect him to be acquitted, but they have to allow for it as a possible outcome in their petition. Harrison's regiment say that the Parliament's former declaration of no further addresses to the King may not be unworthily deserted, but he speedily either acquitted or convicted of the charge therein contained, and Cromwell follows Harrison's text in that. The South Coast 
South Coast garrisons urge that the grand disturbers of this nation's peace may either be cleared of those great and heinous crimes publicly declared and laid to their charge, or else condemned according to principles of law and justice. And those are the five, the four quotations, Harrison's and Cromwell's are the same, and these five um, raise the question of the possibility of the king's acquittal. But to come back to bloodshed, I think there are three ways that blood is discussed in the petitions. Um, the first is that blood is bloodshed is a pollution that must be cleared or cleansed in order to avert the anger of God with the threat of future, future misfortune that that brings. So the Yorkshire petition says, the impartial and speedy execution of justice upon offenders, especially such as are guilty of polluting a land with blood, must be done, so that God may be glorified, the cause and honour of the Parliament asserted, the land cleansed from blood and rendered capable of some happy establishment. Harrison's regiment demand that some speedy and effectual course may be taken for the trial and just punishment of all English, Welsh and Scots convicted enemies and that neither birth nor place may exempt, exempt any from the hand of justice, without which, as the wrath of God will not be appeased, so neither can we expect a happy issue of all our labours. And most interestingly, that is one of the things that Cromwell's men took out of Harrison's text. The Berkshire petition urges that either by this present parliament purged or another and more equal representative chosen, they want to have a true account of all the blood spilt and treasure spent, the guilt of blood so thoroughly purged as no longer in that regard to lay under the wrath of God, and the springs of blood so thoroughly stopped as no longer to lay open the wrath of men. There is a third use of the idea of blood. So um, this is the second, I'm sorry, this is the second, I hope you've got that on your screen. And that is blood as the cost or price paid for specific outcomes. And this runs references to pollution a very close second in the texts. And since they sometimes occur together, um, they, you know, they, it, it's almost a dead heat between blood as pollution and blood as cost or price. And this is the kind of thing that I mean by that. Rainborough's regiment argued that if the utmost purchase of the loss of so much precious and now declared righteous blood be only a liberty to treat with our capital enemy, whether with his dissembled consent, we shall enjoy those liberties that the sword of the Lord and the sword of his people have wrung from his bloody hands, then we are consigned to the most fruitless employment to be always fighting for that we can never obtain. Fleetwood's regiment say they did expect some satisfaction for their services and former losses and a settlement of the kingdom in their birthrights and privileges as the purchase of so much blood and treasure. And Wiltshire suggests that this long, I'm sorry, Wiltshire want that this long distracted nation may be at length restored to build their peace upon foundations of equal government as not knowing for what other use the blood and treasure of this nation hath been thus freely expended. It's a curious phrase, the expense of blood and treasure, and I found by googling it that it has actually been used in the UK Parliament and the US Congress in quite recent times. So it's a traditional expression, the expense of blood and treasure is what war is about in order to purchase whatever the aims of war are. But there is a third sense, and that's bloodshed requiring retribution. And there are only two petitions that use this as their prime argument about blood. And I think they're the only, they're certainly the only two that quote the same biblical verse, as you'll see. Um, Scripps and Sanders' regiment, regiments plead that justice might take place upon all, from the highest to the lowest, from the king to the meanest subject, that they, who to satisfy their lust to support and continue slavery and tyranny in this nation, by their swords have made many mothers childless and children fatherless, may, as to a sufficient number of the principal actors, have their children orphans and their mothers childless, in that happy day when judgment without partiality shall flow down as a stream. 
And they go on to quote the biblical verse, which the third Kentish tradition often does, that notwithstanding all suggestions to the contrary, the trial of Charles Stuart, King, etc., may be vigorously prosecuted, and that no pretenses or overtures whatsoever may cause this honourable house and high court of justice to be satisfied with the blood of three states with less than the blood of those persons who have been the principal authors of its effusion. For as much as God himself hath said, without distinction of persons, that whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, which is Genesis 6, 9. Now, the appearance of the word late in that text was an insertion when it was printed, because in fact, when this petition was presented to Parliament, Charles had already been dead for three days. Um, and without the word late, it read Charles Stuart, King, etc., because that was how he had been charged at his trial as Char Charles Stuart, King, and all the other titles um, that the British monarchy claimed. Um, and these really are the only two I can find uh, that fulfil that image of the, um, the necessity that blood must have blood the ancient law of Italian, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and so on. So if blood was the cost, the price paid for ultimate aims, what were the aims of the just war? This, this concept of the just war underlines the petitioning soldiers' unwavering conviction that they have fought for justice the assertion that Parliament had fought a defensive war was so fundamental to its supporters that it was the never agreed first clause of the Newport Treaty, which Charles I never really accepted, um, but which many of the petitioners thought meant that Charles had accepted his responsibility for the bloodshed. So Lambert's brigade recall how the Parliament, having acquainted the kingdom with the king's intentions to draw the sword of war against them for the maintaining of his own arbitrary power, and by their several declarations, remonstrances, etc., given clear satisfaction to all the well-affected of the justness of a defensive war, and thereby inciting and encouraging all as they tendered their native rights and freedoms to rise in arms for their defence, we were induced out of judgment and conscience to appear accordingly. The Oxfordshire County Group, sorry, the Oxfordshire County Troop raised in 1648 say that the, grand re the ground and reason which first moved us to engage with you against the King and all his adherents was that judging you then to be the supreme authority of this kingdom, whom we expected to redress all our grievances and provide for our safety. That was why they took up arms in 1648. Reynolds's regiment, who also took up arms in 1648, um, said, if we shall speak of the equal, common and just engagements in blood for liberty or justice, which is that alone that countenances or justifies war, we might speak much. Christopher Hill, in the English Bible in the 17th century revolution, ventured the opinion that the concept of blood guilt almost certainly had greater influence with those below the political nation than level arguments for a democratic republic, because, he went on to say, the latter's sophisticated democratic and constitutional theories perhaps counted for less than ordinary 17th century people. On the contrary, it's central to my analysis of the petitions in this period that religious ideas and commitments did not drive out or block political ideas among the activists who composed and subscribed them. I'll begin with one quite complex to us political idea that is repeated many times in the petitions, often in a, to us, shockingly casual way, slavery. This is actually found in 17 petitions, 13 of them military. We find it used almost, it's almost become a cliche. The king hath betrayed the trust reposed in him and raised war against the nation to enslave it, say Ireton's regiment. God hath given us a total victory over the enemies of our, our enemies of our liberty and given those into our hands that would have enslaved us, according to Ingalls' base regiment. 
Harrison's regiment say that our exact and most impartial observations dictate to us a resurrection, if it were ever buried, of that old design to continue England's slavery. Hewson's regiment cannot, we dare not make such a forfeiture of our, un, our unparalleled mercies, nor betray our dear-bought freedom as to leave ourselves and the nation to the freedom of one man's will. Lambert's brigade say those principles of, of freedom and justice that we were first called forth to act upon in opposition to the king's unjust, unlimited will for the recovery and defence of the common rights and freedoms of the people was why they joined. As Quentin Skinner has been arguing for many years, the political use of this name sidestepped the institution of chattel slavery in both ancient Roman and early modern colonial societies, employing the classical legal definition of slavery, subjection to the will of another, as a highly emotive argument against arbitrary rule. And, and, and that really, I think, is how it became a cliche. But it, it, it was astonishing to me when I counted it up how often that actually occurred. But it wasn't the only political idea. This is a more familiar one. The idea of supreme authority or sovereignty. That the House of Commons was, the House and the House of Commons alone, was the representative of the people that established the freedom of England as a self-governing nation was understood by all those who demanded the removal of the King's and House of Lords veto on legislation, the so-called negative voices. The London levellers say, we had not engaged on your part, but that we judged this honourable house to be the supreme authority of England, as chosen by and representing the people, and entrusted with absolute power for redress of grievances and provision for safety. The Wiltshire petitioners ask, can people feed themselves with the empty names of peace, freedom and liberty when the supreme power is still by you undetermined that was the first cause of all our wars, distempers and miseries, which is a line that was taken in the remonstrance as well. Fleetwood, Swallies and Barkstead's regiments petitioning together um, demand that the supreme power may be declared and determined, that, these, that the want thereof may not be the ground of future as it has been of the former wars. So what are the remedies proposed for this situation? Um, here are some examples. The Boston garrison plead that government may have its due constitution, the people of England their just rights, and the kingdom a speedy and through God's blessing a happy settlement. The Hull garrison argues that by, an, by a universal and mutual agreement, it be enacted and decreed in perpetuum re memoriam that the power of all future representatives may be inferior only to that of the people in order to the preservation of them in their just and proper rights. And there are several, but difficult to find, there are several references to the ultimate power of the people, even if their representatives don't meet their demands. And Ingleby's regiment urged that likewise sufficient caution and straight bonds be given to future kings for preventing the enslaving of the people hereafter. And that grounds of encouragement be given to the people of succeeding generations for defending themselves against the like attempt. While several regiments reported to be petitioning at St Albans urged that provision Provisions be made for the free people of England that both we and future generations may defend ourselves against insulting kings. To me, the most striking, oh yes, and I, I'm omitting the most strange one, which is Hewson's regiment suggesting that both monarchy and parliament be replaced by an oligarchic council modelled on the governments of Venice, Holland and Switzerland. That is a real outlier. There's no other like that. But to me, the most striking thing about these and other demands for what was called the settlement of the kingdom is their concern for the future. In general, petitioners do not appeal to past precedents and only two, the Northumberland Horse Regiment and Buckinghamshire, dwell on the Norman yoke imposed on the English by the conquest six centuries earlier. The dominant idea in the proposals for constitutional reform is that things have got to be different in future. I can't find any references to the ancient constitution as such or really 
in the kind of terms that were offered by the Petition of Right or by various parliamentary documents in the early 1640s, the diff correction of the situation for the future, it seems to me, is fundamental to the demands of these petitions. I've selected the quotations on the last few screens specifically to illustrate my contention, which is that these petitions shared in what David Como has described as the radicalisation among parliamentarians of attitudes to four main issues. Charles I as a ruler, monarchy itself, parliamentary sovereignty and the House of Lords. The petitions are actually full of other issues that I have no time here to discuss in detail. A dozen of the petitions, starting with the London Levellers, present a long list of practical reforms, each of them unique, though drawing to some extent on the example of that first one. But I want to go to something that has been raised with me, and that is bread and butter issues. With regard to bread and butter issues, such as the army still mounting arrears of pay and the burden of taxation on the counties of England, there are many references to these in the petitions, but no petition deals only with these, and the ones that do are remarkably consistently the most political. They're not the apolitical ones. <laughs> They're not the ones that demand only justice. Um, the, one, the ones that, do, that, do, that raise the bread and butter issues particularly this issue, free quarter. This issue united petitioners from both inside and outside the army and came to be regarded as a hot political issue. Free quarter meant the taking of accommodation and food without immediate payment, though those on whom it was imposed were given receipts for future repayment. Meanwhile, a certain amount of each soldier's pay was withheld permanently for the quarter they had received and were normally expected to pay for out of their wages. The Commonwealth Exchequer papers for many counties show that the promissory notes given for free quarter were honoured in the case of Surrey as soon as the fighting in 1648 was over. Um, that was my spot check on it. Um, at a rate, I'm told, that was higher than the rate of the soldiers' reductions. I can't remember who told me that, and if they're here, I'm very grateful for that. That's, I mean, in, in fact, it makes me understand the formulation in some of the petitions better. Here are some quotations. That your petitioners taking into their serious thoughts the intolerable burden which the kingdom lies under by reason of free quarter, the many sad complaints which our ears are daily witnesses of, and the odium which hereby reflects on their your Excellency and the Army needs to be dealt with. Scroops and Sanders' regiment urge the taking off from the country of that insupportable burden of famine threatening free quarter, the detestation of both soldier and countrymen. Prides and Danes regiments say that that which is so unsufferable, insufferable for us to take and so intolerable for the people to bear, namely free quarter, may be forthwith taken off by sending some speedy supplies to the army. Hewson's regiment describe it as a renewed design upon this army by forcing us to free quarter to make us the contempt and hissing of the people. And Hardress Waller's brigade demand that the cunning device upon the army for hateful free quarter and the contrivers thereof be discovered and the army vindicated from the slander thence raised upon it. But if you're looking for religious language in the petitions, you will find plenty of it. Here are the biggest examples, the most detailed examples, which are actually quite untypical. But here we go, religious language. The Newcastle, Newcastle and Tynemouth garrisons say, when we consider how gloriously the right hand of our God hath exalted itself in power to the dashing in pieces the common enemy of this kingdom and the overthrow of all that have risen up against us, we cannot but confess that there is none so glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders as our God, and therefore desire to wait upon him in the way of his judgments and confess that according to the greatness of his own heart hath he done these things. Prides and Dean's regiment say, seeing God hath hitherto made you faithful and the trust reposed in you, 
This is addressed to Fairfax, by the way. Seeing God hath hitherto made you faithful in the trust reposed in you, and there being such an opportunity once more to appear for the public interest, you may be confident of the providence of God, who delights in the way of justice, truth, and equity. And it's quite remarkable the kind of terms in which Fairfax is addressed. Um, remember, he is still the commander, not Oliver Cromwell. Um, but Bristol goes to extreme lengths, I think, um, and there's more like it. This is only a short extract from the Bristol petition. When we beheld the glorious splendour of justice and righteousness beaming forth itself in your remonstrance to the House of Commons, November the 18th, 1648, we were filled with joy and satisfaction that the Divine Presence had again overshadowed you and appeared hereby to us with smiles of love and pledges of favour when with the night of ruin we were almost overwhelmed. But these examples are exceptional. The vast majority of the petitions acknowledge the role of God in the army's success in battle and support and support of the parliamentarian cause, but in very few words. And I mean, when trawling the text to try and find other quotations, I could find only phrases that occur in almost all the petitions saying, through God's blessing, we have won these battles um, and that God willing, we will succeed more. Um, it, this being 17th century England, it's actually more surprising that four of them don't mention God at all. Specifically religious demands, such as freedom of belief and worship, or the abolition of tithes, are mentioned in half a dozen each, overlapping. Also, Herefordshire asks for preachers to those that sit in darkness, meaning Wales, and Somerset urges further reformation according to the word of God. But that's about it in terms of specific religious demands in the petitions. Many petitioners explicitly link religion to other motivations, saying that they fought for or supported Parliament from motives of religion and reason, or judgment and conscience, which is the favourite formulation. It is, in fact, impossible to disunite politics and religion in this discourse. But what I'm vehemently opposed to is the tendency to let religion trump any other motivation, to claim that if religion's there, it was all really about religion. I call this religious reductionism by analogy with what Marxists used to be accused of as economic reductionism. And it's very common. And I think that the selective reading of a few petitions has led to a misunderstanding about the role of religion uh, in the petitioners' attitudes and motivations, and it needs to be looked at again. Finally, what I cannot find at all in any of the petitions is godly rule. By this I mean the rule of the saints, or King Jesus, as in the 1650 Declaration, or the imposition of God's elect on an unwilling nation. Or, for example, the call that Lord, the call that Lord Grey of Groby, which may, who may have had something to do with the Leicester's petition, but it's quite unlike what he wrote in his pamphlet in 1648, called Old English Blood Boiling in the Hearts of Leicestershire Men, I think that's a magnificent title. But he argued that the fight was to preserve a kingdom that must be saved against its will, for which God hath so immediately and even miraculously spoken from heaven. Along with the Newcastle petition presented to Parliament on 10th of October, the moderate published a letter in support of the petition, but not part of it, though it's often be quote, being quoted as if it was, praying to God to direct those in whose name it is written, for the good of the poor commons of England, who are likely to be bought and sold because they're ignorant of their own freedoms and birthrights, which they are willing to sell for a mess of pottage so that they may enjoy a slavish peace. That has quite a familiar ring about it. Stupid voters. There is nothing, I repeat, nothing like this in any of the petitions. The saints whose blood has been shed is only used, the word is only used once by the Dover Castle garrison, Denby's cast, Denby Castle's garrison declare their support for army and the many thousands of Israel who support it. Again, very biblical. Pride Regiment say that good men rather than good laws must save us, though we disjoin them not. And Nottingham Castle's garrison ventures to hope that goodness shall at last disthrone greatness. And you may say 
the, these have elements of godly rule in them, but they're nothing like the call of the 1650 declaration for the reign of Christ on earth. And to me, this is the great divide in radical politics that followed the end of the civil wars. Popular sovereignty, the foundation of the Leverless political, political analysis and many others, versus godly rule, which some of them and many of their followers, followers which some of them and many of their followers accepted as the result of the revolution, though they had never previously advocated it. That belief in popular sovereignty was, and still is, what I believe to be the basis of the alternative revolution of 1649. And that's it. <laughs> I'm coming back. Stop sharing. Thank you, Nora. That was an exceptional paper. And it was great, really interesting. And I particularly liked your commentary about religious reductionism because I think I totally agree with you on that. Veronica knows. Um, so now I'm opening the floor for questions. Does anyone have any questions or commentaries for Norma? Nora, sorry. You can either pose questions by raising your hand. Timothy Harris has a question. Yeah, I'm not sure if I have a question. But forgive me, I have to come downstairs and have my lunch because it's lunchtime here. So I'm sitting at my dining room table uh, and I can't see where I am on the screen. So I don't know if you can see me or whether I'm... I can, can you, see you. Yeah. You can see me. I, 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 did, I love that talk. And I, uh, I mean, I'd just like to sit down and talk with you more about this because I have lots of mini questions, but not necessarily a main one. I, I too like the point about religious reductionism because I think it was, it was used as argument to sort of downplay the significance of constitutional conflict, which I believe is there. Uh, let, me, let me ask a question this way. Um, Ten years ago, I was at a conference uh, on scripting revolutions uh, organized by Keith Baker at Stanford. And Keith, and a lot of French historians have this idea that the French invent the modern world, you know, they invent print culture and the public sphere, and they invented revolutions. So Keith has this idea that before 1789, uh, revolutions happened, but were not made, and that there were no scripts for revolution. And it strikes me that what you're talking about here, and I don't know how far you want to push this, is you've got a series of different scripts for revolutions. I mean, clearly the English Revolution well, didn't just happen, it was made, and that people were putting forward revolutionary platforms and, and programs. So I, at a general level, I was going to invite you to comment on that. And what you said about Hewson intrigued me, uh, because he has this image of an ideal of an oligarchic republic based on Venice and Geneva. Is that right? What was the other one? He said, he said, he said Venice, Holland and Switzerland. Yeah, Venice, Holland and Switzerland. And uh, this came out of my talk a, couple, uh, a few weeks ago when Ariel I say I'm, I put some sources towards me. The, the project for Eleutheria in the Bahamas in 1647 is, is actually based on the idea of an oligarchic republic right. based on Venice or, or Geneva. And so I was wondering if there was any link there. Anyway, that's a series of observations. And then if you want to reflect on them. But it strikes me that you, you have, I mean, what I was looking at um, this morning, just before your talk, uh, a parliamentary declaration written just after the Battle of Edge Hill, which was in response to the King's Declaration. And of course, a lot of this language is already there. And it's, it's, a, it's a declaration that Lilburn later appeals to, claiming this is what Parliament claimed to be standing for already in 1642. So they can't let us down. So again, I, I, we must avoid this religious reductionism. I do believe um, you know, there are these different scripts for radical reform that people have in mind, uh, 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 different revolutions they want to. Uh, anyway. That's, that's my thoughts. I'll let you respond to that. Is that, how, is that how you see some of these petitions? They're offering different scripts for revolution? Is, yes, I... And I think that's a very nice way of describing it. And of course, they're drawing those scripts from what they've already read and talked and discussed. Um, and they're putting them forward, not all unanimously or on the same note, but they're contributing to it. And what it amounts to, I like the phrase that is used by someone whose name immediately escapes me, um, that says it's, it's calling for a different relationship between government and subject. And he, whose name escapes me, refuses to recognise that as a revolution. But if 
a new relationship between government and subject isn't a revolution. I'd like to know what is. Um, Clive Holmes has pressed me for a definition of revolution, and quite honestly, I don't have one that fits all circumstances. Um, but certainly, I believe that and I believe that the, the concept of revolution in the political sense was definitely around in 17th century England. Oh, yeah. And the fact that Thomas Hobbes said it should mean a circular movement is not evidence that that's what people thought it meant, but evidence that that's what Hobbes thought they ought to think it meant. No, I've written on this as well, and Hobbes is yeah. untypical, really. When revolution is used in the political sense, it means a regime change. Yes. Invariably. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but, but no one in the petition just uses that fake, that that word. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. No, I have not. If if, if I'd find it there, I'd be celebrating it. <laughs> Oliver Cromwell talks about the two great revolutions as being the discovery of the new world uh, and the Reformation. Right. Now you could you could argue about Cromwell's view of the Reformation, whether it's backward looking, but you can't argue that the discovery of the new world was a circular movement, returning back anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> And I think you asked a direct question, and I've now forgotten what Well, the Bahamas, the, the Eletheria project, where they had this... Oh, no, that, not that one, because I, that, that I don't know, but I'd be very yeah. interested to find out. Yeah, okay. Because that is based... Were there any of... What was the date? Well, it's 1647, actually. It's quite early, mm. and I don't think they set off there uh, until a bit later, but... Uh, and Parliament eventually endorses it in 1649, but it's going to have religious toleration, and they're not supposed to call each other names, religious names. Uh, but the ideal is sort of going to be based on um, sort of oligarchic republics, supposedly. It never really gets off the ground, that's the problem. Uh, but it's a, a group of people who, uh, who will get stranded there, I suppose, and they, they decide to set up their own sort of mini colony there. And uh, it's one of the islands in the Bahamas. And but, there is, of course, a lot of coming and going between the colonies in America and yeah. England during the during yeah. the wars. But they did um, the try Northumberland. Yeah. The Northumberland but, Horse Regiment, which had a very long list of proposals, uh, was commanded by George Fenwick, who was a returned colonist. Yes, there's a lot of coming. So and going, there may be yeah. a similar movement with the Bahamas. But because it's a new colony, they actually try and draft a constitution. So this is how they would frame starting a government if, if they could start from scratch, which is why it's interesting. But anyway, I'll, I'll stop now. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. No, thank you for stopping, but thank you for what you said. <laughs> <laughs> um, next, we have Veronica with, with a question. Yeah, well, thank you, Nora, for such a brilliant paper. It was fantastic. I, I think I have all sorts of questions, but I will limit myself to just one for now, because I, I, I mm -hmm. think that people might want to interact as well. But uh, on following some of the discussion that you, you were just mentioning uh, with Tim Harris, um, I would like to, to address the concept of revolution, considering what you mentioned as that petitions are talking about the future and expectation expectations on future uh, designs. I think that this is really interesting when we think about this different uh, concepts of revolution in early modern period, because if we are talking about always coming back, the past has a, a very um, important uh, um significance in this but now we are trying to yes. you know include another time and a time where uh, when things would you know full, will be fulfilled it's also a kind of religiously uh, inspired i guess but i would like to to ask you to expand a little bit more on on this uh, issue of the future and the petitions well i i, I was very interested because i just spotted this quite recently um, that while there are two trains of thought that are very, very much discussed by historians in, uh, among parliamentarians in this period, and one is the Norman yoke, the idea that the English liberty was taken away by William the Conqueror, and the other is the ancient constitution, of course, you know, Pocock and all the rest of it. Um, and I didn't find that, well, I found the Norman yoke in two, the Northumberland Torch Regiment and Buckinghamshire, um, but it's completely absent from the rest. Oh yes, there is one reference to Norman slavery, um, and that's the only other reference to it. Um, but when I think about what's usually said about the ancient constitution, 
it's just not there. I mean, they, they talk about English liberties, right? Um, and they talk about, I don't, in fact, I don't, well, I was going to say, I don't think the word restore is used, but I expect it is in the sense of restoring English liberties, which have been lost under Charles I. But there's none of that appeal to the long term traditions of how English government was thought of um, in any of these petitions. That just was at a different level of discourse altogether um, from, from the one that these, uh, these soldiers and others are discussing. And I think that uh, it was then that the word future caught my attention. And I think that and the, the cases that I cited were not closely related to religion, not related to the godly rule, the reign of Christ on earth, which of course the 1650 declaration is. Um, but it's, it's the absence of that as well, not only absence to not only absence of any appeal to long term past traditions, but the absence of any appeal to the religious concepts, which were definitely in circulation. I mean, everybody that writes about the fifth monarchy writes about its prehistory in that period, and yet you don't find it in the petition. Um, so there must be a certain kind of discourse which is going on in army circles and in and and not necessarily among the commanders. In fact, when you look at the lists of um, names, so there are only 46 officers named um, and uh, more than half of them are junior officers, the kind for which the term subaltern was originally used um, and they're discussing with their men or with each other and uh, they must be aware of um, pamphlets that advocate the rule of Jesus Christ on earth and pamphlets that talk about and indeed parliaments uh, Parliament's declarations that talk about the ancient constitution, but that's not what bothers them. What bothers them is that things have got to change. And it's Diane Perkins, I think, who said that so for the soldiers it would be simply unbearable if nothing changed. What had they fought for? And they had fought for change and not for a restoration of anything past. And I would call that a revolution. Yeah. But <laughs> much more is to be said on that. <laughs> Thank you, Nora. Um, uh, does anyone have a question? Or I might just use my privilege as governor as well. And I just want to add something to, to Veronica, because you mentioned um, that the Norman York appears and the ancient constitution a, a little bit, but in different ways. I was wondering if you could identify any uh, specific mentions to Magna Carta and how it appeared if if it did and the way you were talking about this different time period time perception this language in petitions that draws to the future I was thinking about Nicholas McDowell's work about this linguistic innovation that radicalism brought to during the civil war period and I was just wondering if you think if if you're familiar with that idea if you'd say that the petitions also forge this specific language this specific revolutionary language that is very proper and specific to petitions as well is that something that could make sense um as far as magna carta is concerned it just isn't there um as far as the revolutionary language is concerned this is why i thought it was so important to publish the texts um as the raw material for other people and that, I mean, I, I was asked to write up the texts for publication. And that's, uh, that was my excuse for chickening out of having any conclusions of my own up to this point. Um, but uh, I, I, if, if you can find revolutionary language developing in the petitions, which goodness knows, with, with, with digitalization, digitization nowadays, it's very, very easy to search texts for words and concepts. I don't believe in the clouds that associate words together because they can be quite distracting. Um, but I think that their um, common right and freedom, I think, is the most popular. I don't, I'm not quite sure if that's new, um, whether Parliament had used that, um, that, that formulation, but common right and freedom is a very common expression in the petitions of what they're aiming at 
what they're aiming to secure, not to restore, but to secure, to achieve, mm -hmm. simply to get. Yeah. But that's a very interesting question, which I'm sure you'll find the texts quite useful in thinking about. Sure. Yes. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Bruno Galliano. Um, first, he's thanking your presentation. He said it was great. And he would like to ask you about other intellectual sources besides the Bible for the petitions you mentioned. And he's asking this because he's he's developing a, a PhD research about Selden. And he has recently found mentions of Selden in a couple of 1640 petitions. Oh hmm. I haven't. It's true. I know who Selden was, and I know what aspect of Selden I'm interested in in, in another context. Um, but uh, the, the the whole question of the the source, the legal sources of parliamentarian thinking, is something that I um, have only scratched the surface of in my own reading. I think it's quite possible that um, the ideas coming from legal sources are mediated by Parliament's own declarations because I took it for granted that, as has long been argued about Lilburn, um, that Parliament's declarations were a major source for his ideas and his way of expressing them. Um, so I would think that the, and it may be that the works that have dealt with that so far about the influence of Selden, Cook, other legal thinkers on Parliament, I have missed a lot. There, there may be things that they've missed. So I would be very, very interested to find out if there are different ways of reading Selden into these ideas. But I can't answer the question. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Um, Veronica has another question. I have lots of questions. <laughs> um, uh, actually, I, I would like to ask something similar to, to Bruno, but in, in the other sense. Um, so, uh, concerning the Bible mentions, uh, have you um, seen any particular books that are always uh, showing up in the petitions, like uh, particular no. quotations from Bible, or how how was it? Because um, I'm, I'm studying um, radical and seditious publications in the 60s and it's very interesting how some 50 monarchists or other sorts of uh, radical groups are uh, they are seeing they are looking back to to the 40s movement and trying to address the same issues as a, a just war and how it, it was necessary to do this retribution and they are particularly addressing sometimes uh, the book of matthew and commenting on how um even though uh, Jesus Christ had said that you should not resist no evil. When we are talking about Charles uh, the first and Charles the second, we are talking about slavery and then all the, the the topics that you mentioned. And then we should resist because you were you shouldn't resist evil with violence, but you should resist evil. So it, it's very interesting how this language it's is being you know um, renovated again and reused in the 60s as well. So that's why I was thinking about this uh, particular Bible quotations. Um, in answer to the first part of your question, are there books of the Bible that keep, or incidents in the Bible that keep, keep coming up again and again? The answer to that is no. Um, the stories that have been picked on, like the story of Ahab or the of Agag, are somehow explaining the thinking of pro-parliamentarian radicals. And actually, they, they, each of them occurs once in the whole body of petitions. I think David, okay, David and Absalom once. Absalom with his curly hair, which it seems to me immediately conjures up cavaliers. Um, and and the, these, are, these are not stories that are repeated. They're stories that are drawn on by one petition at a time. And I, I, when you said that about resistance um, to governments being legitimate in some circumstances. There is one quotation that I've noticed about that. It begins that all governments properly constituted ought to be obeyed, but not in evil commands. I am aware of what occurrence of that, but it may be that I'm, because I've been looking for other things, I haven't noticed the others. But yes, I think that the, the germs of that are there. 
Um, but of course, these um, are all either soldiers or those who believe the army has fought a just war. They're not. They're not going to talk about non-violence. They're going to talk about how violence is justified, um, because those are the circumstances. And and I can well imagine that when that there's no prospect of armed resistance um, anymore, then people turn to discussing non-violence, which is, I mean, classic with the Quakers. Um, thank you, Nora. Now, Professor Philip Wilkham has a question as well. Hi there. Uh, thanks so much, Nora. That was a fantastic talk. Um, I just want to follow up on two of the questions. Um, Tim's idea of the script of revolution. I'm just wondering, could you talk a little bit more about how these petitions are put together? Do you have any sense of the kind of the key brokers and accumulators of um, text in terms of, you know, how they're, how they're made and presented um, to the to the authorities? And I'm just wondering, in terms of Bruno's question, do you get a sense of uh, classical sources um, that the um, petitioners are drawing on as well, either directly through kind of citations and quotes, or maybe indirectly through using um, classical language like translation of slavery into the vernacular and so on? There is one text that completely fulfills all those conditions, and that's Robert Overton's long, long, long preamble, which is officers agreed to attach to their list of demands because he quotes Cicero and Tacitus um, and uh, but but and, and I thought oh you know this is great but and and actually he doesn't he doesn't quote religious sources at all he quotes classical ones because this is about politics this is about government this is about change and it's not about religion though Overton um, his biographer uh, said that what a religious man he was, and he's even credited some, by some with being a fifth monarchist later. But I don't, I don't think so. Uh, and um, the, uh, the it's such a secular political tract it really is <laughs> great to read. But the um, the question of how these were put together, unfortunately, we have very very little information. We have two accounts of the meetings that agreed the text of petitions. One is Lambert's brigade, because his um, the secretary to that uh, collection of regiments under Lambert, um, which was uh, uh, taking over the siege of Pontefract from Oliver Cromwell, um, was William Margetts, who was a friend of William Clark's and of various other um, radical, um, uh, radical secretaries, writers, um, writers about the and, and in fact that I thought the word administrators in the army. Um, so Margaret's took very very careful minutes of the um, the agreeing of the petition from Lambert's brigade, and it it was made very very clear um, that the uh, officers who were not present were allowed to give their opinion, and that this would be incorporated when the uh, when the petition was forwarded to Parliament which is quite a long distance from Pontefract to London. Um, so uh, they, and, and it was noted that other officers, some officers had disagreed, their names were recorded. Because actually the recording of dissents in the publication of votes in Parliament was one of the demands of several of the petitions, the registering of dissent. And in Lambert's brigade, this was done, that the names of two or three officers who objected to the petition were recorded before it was sent off to London. In the case of the Common Council of London, this is an absolutely wonderful source. They appended to their petition an account of the meeting of the 13th of January 1649, where some of those present wanted to bring forward a petition which had already been printed in the name of certain citizens of London. And the mayor and corporation, sorry, the mayor and aldermen who had been required to administer the new oath without saving the king, um, walked out of the meeting. Um, it, another chair was found and the meeting proceeded not just to pass the petition, but to revise it. So it is the only case, apart from Harrison's and Cromwell's regiments, where we have the original text and the revised text. And you can see how much discussion led to what changes um, in the London Common Council's petition, and and then it was sent. It, then it it was presumably 
subscribed by those who were at the meeting. Um, in the case of the Kentish petition, um, it's Jackie Eels has done quite a lot of work on this and the 1,135 names and it's clear that they come from quite a few different places and indeed the copy that I used mainly, which is not the copy that Jackie used mainly, has marginal notes like the note about how the, the, the party's own hands and notes about the areas but it's not clear where those areas start and end. Canterbury, Hive, Tenterden um, and Sandwich. Um, so you can see that people must have gone round these places collecting signatures and that in some cases the original sheets with the individual, there's only about five marks instead of written signatures, they were mostly written signatures uh, and uh, people went around collecting them and then um, in some cases, they were like the protestation returns, uh, re-inscribed on nice tidy sheets um, or just collected together as they stood. Um, I think that the copy in the Bodleian that I referred to most of the time was Lenthal's co copy, the speaker's copy, um, which somebody had made for him. Uh, and where they, I, I tried to trace where these two copies came from and there's an 18th century printed version as well and it's quite interesting um, but uh, un unfortunately that just is the longest list of names that's preserved for us um, and the old one that includes any estimate of, of uh, how, uh, how they were originally signed, signed by the people with their own hands um, but uh, it would be nice, I mean and that's all I could find but there may be others there may be more information and I hope that the publication of the book will inspire others to try and find out more about it um, the very very interesting one from Wiltshire uh, there was another printed copy a broadside which isn't in Ebo and it's in the collection of economic documents in Senate House in the University of London London University Library and Ted Valance very kindly drew my attention to this and it had 21 names on it um, and there is I think it's the same one that says that these are our commissioners I think uh, I'm sorry maybe there's another one that says that these are our commissioners for ensuring that the safety of the English people is taken care of basically um, so there's a there's, a, there's uh, whether it's an alternative county committee or the county county committee already in existence um, that it was a process right it was a process not only of drafting it agreeing it agreeing to adopt it circulating it for subscription but also in one or two cases making sure that it wasn't forgotten but entrusting certain people, first of all, to take it up to Parliament. And the Commons journals often record the names of those who presented the petitions on behalf of their counties, localities. Um, it, uh, very few regiments addressed Parliament directly. They were supposed to go through Fairfax. Um, but the, um, the, 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 the post-subscription um, process was taking it to London and sometimes in the case of the Berkshire petitioners they say um, that they uh, that their petition was at first turned away and that the people that they sent with the petition remained in London for four more oh my goodness. thank you Nora thanks so much that was that was fascinating. Can I just ask I, 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 am I back? Am I back? I yeah, lost my internet connection. I'm here. And yeah, just, I can see myself with the rest of you on the screen. Yeah. Is, okay. um, the, uh, where was I? Yes, uh, the Berkshire petitioners' representatives waited for four weeks before the petition was, was even read by Parliament um, because they presented it, I think, just after the 10th of October debate in which it was decided not to accept petitions that weren't welcome basically and um, the Berkshire petitioners representatives hung around in London for four more weeks before it was accepted so yes I mean the, the these are the scraps of information I have about the question that you're asking basically well, that's fabulous thanks very much
Does anyone have any other questions? I know Veronica is full of them. <laughs> if I may just make a short comment, because I know that we are running already out of time, but uh, Another thing that I think it's really interesting concerning petitions is, is, is thinking about the, the public sphere and, and how these topics were addressed also to um, a public that would ponder, that would think about uh, the things discussed in Parliament and, and also to you know, participate in politics. And I don't know how um, this idea of a public appears in, in, in the petitions, if they are also calling for a people to uh, respond or to interact. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, the, the first article I wrote and submitted, but didn't get accepted on this, uh, went on at great length about David Zaret and the, and, and the public sphere. And I think, and again, you think, as somebody said, the French think they invented the public sphere. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't, uh, and uh, the, the, all the characteristics of uh, a sphere of, of public discussion and debate about politics uh, and other things, religion as well, um, it, it is absolutely central to understanding the context of these petitions. But that was a long time ago and a lot more must have been written about that since I originally um, drafted an article. And your sources in, in particular are very interesting to reflect on that, I think, because um, petitions evoke this idea of the public sphere, not only as to who they are addressing, but also on who they claim to be talking or speaking by, uh, in the name of. It, it, yes, it yes. It has this imperative of a large community or a, a, a multitude of people petitioning. So it's very interesting to see how this idea of a public sphere operates on both ends when it comes to petitions, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, uh, wonderful. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Well, as we're almost running out of time, I'd like to once again thank you, Nora, for um, agreeing to participate and also would like to invite everyone to read her book. Yes. <laughs> very interesting. Um, it was a pleasure to read. And I'd also like to extend the invitation for our next meeting, which is going to be on the 25th of May. We're going to be receiving Professor Jonathan Scott with the presentation Ocean World, How Early Modern London Became the First World City. And this uh, session in particular is going to be at a different time because Professor Scott is based in New Zealand. So our next meeting uh -huh. is going to be at half 8 p.m. British time and half 4 p.m. Brazilian time. So just be aware, it's going to be uh, Professor, Professor Tim Harris was just saying, doing the math I could tell but to see what it's going to be. Did uh, you say 8.30 British time? 8.30 p.m. Yes. British time. Summer time, yeah. And, and 4.30 p.m. Um, Brazilian time. And once again, thank you very much for everyone who turned up today. It was a very wonderful paper and also a very wonderful discussion. Thank you very much and see you in two weeks.